The little song that we sang with the kids a moment ago is one of the truest songs we'll ever sing. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And yet how many people do not know that God loves them? One of the most famous and oft-quoted verses of the Bible is John 3, verse 16. We're in a series of lessons about key passages of God's Word where core messages of the Bible are expressed. For sure, this is one of them because this verse is a statement of God's loving redemptive acts and His loving intentions toward us. Is there someone in your life, a human being, that you've always known was in your corner? that you've always known was for you, that you've always known wanted only the best for you, that loved you no matter what. And you may say yes and you may say no, but let me tell you that God is that person. Regardless of what your experience has been with human beings, God loves you. Jesus loves me. God loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Romans 8 verse 31 says, God is for us. Who can be against us? That's the truth. God is for us. He's not rooting against us. He's not hoping we're, we're going to fail. God is cheering us on. He's our biggest fan. He wants more good for us than anyone else. Exodus 34, verse 5, on Mount Sinai, when the Almighty came down in a cloud and manifested His presence with Moses, He said, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, uh, showing mercy unto thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That is the God that I want to tell you about this morning. John 3.16. You've heard it all your life. We're going to look at each word in this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but should have eternal life. We've said it so often, heard it so often, that I don't think we're going to listen to it unless we slow down a little bit and pull it apart and see what it says. So I'm going to throw a lot of Scripture at you today, but I'd like you to focus on this one verse. If you want to turn your Bible to just one passage, if you want to write some more down, that's fine, but just keep it at John 3, right there open at John 3:16. And let's study for a little bit together. See, the first word in this verse is for. Surely, preacher, you're not going to preach on for. Yes, I am. Not for, but F-O-R. This means, this little word is so highly significant because it shows that this famous verse is the explanation for something that came before it in the context. It's explaining why something is true that was said in the verses before. Why is that? How can that be? For, see, this verse is the explanation. So let's go back to John 3, verse 14, where the context begins. He refers to this strange story in the 21st chapter of Numbers in the Old Testament where the people had been grumbling and complaining against God and God sent these these poisonous snakes among the people of Israel and they were getting snake bit by the thousands, and they, there were so many snakes they couldn't get away from them, and people were falling around. The poison was getting into their bodies, and they were crying out to God for help. And our God is a merciful God. He's a gracious God. And so God said, Okay, Moses, I want to give these people a way to survive. And so he told Moses, strange story, to make this brass snake and to put it on this standard and lift it high up on this standard, high up above the people. And he told the people that if they would just look at that snake and focus their eyes on that snake, then he'd he'd take care of them and they would live. They wouldn't perish. They wouldn't die. And Jesus says, in talking to Nicodemus here, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, and you have to know the story of Numbers 21, Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, what's that business about being lifted up? Okay, Moses lifts up the snake way high above the people so that they can all stare at it and look at it. John 8, verse 28 says, When you shall lift up the Son of Man, 
Then you will know that I am He. John 12, verse 32, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. This he said concerning the kind of death he was going to die. What kind of death did Jesus die, church? He was lifted up on a what? On a cross. He was crucified, see? So just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes on him may in him have eternal life. So where do I need to focus my eyes? Where do I need the focus of my life to be on? Not a snake lifted up on a pole, but I need the eyes of my life focused on the crucified Jesus. Don't I? Isn't that what he's saying? Sure he is. So look at the next slide. How are these, this snake lifted up in the desert way back then, and the crucified Jesus Christ, both a remedy... For a certain death, those people were snake bit and dying. And in a very real way, all of us who are guilty of sin, and that's all of us, right? We're snake bit and dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. But there's a remedy for that sin because we have a gracious God. The second word in the uh, verse is God. See, this is the explanation. For, here's how that can be true. For... God. God got involved. God acted. Could God have let those people die in the desert? He could have, couldn't he? But he didn't want to. He loved them. He wanted to give them another chance like he loves you and me and always wants to give us another chance. And so God provided a way. God is the subject of the sentence in John 3, 16. There's two verbs, loved and gave. See, God is the subject, though, of the entire verse. God. Go back to John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So the God of John three sixteen is the God who was in the beginning, the God who made all things, the God who was with the Word of God who became flesh, that's the God of John 3.16. John 1.18. Nobody has ever seen God. But the one and only God who was in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. We've never seen God. God is a spirit. But Jesus Christ has revealed God. Jesus Christ, God's love letter to the earth, He's revealed God to man. This is the God of John 3.16. John 3.34, the one whom God has sent. Who's that, church? That's Jesus Christ. He speaks the words of God. And so God sent Christ who's speaking the words of John 3.16, and He's trying to tell us about the love of God. This is the God that wants every one of us to be his children and loves us more than we love our own children. This is the God who loved and who gave. What's next? God so loved. There will never be a moment in your life ever, and there never has been a moment in your life when God has not loved you. You love your children when they do good and when they do bad, don't you? You don't approve of the stuff they do bad, but you still love your children. There's never been a time when God does not love you. There's nobody on earth who loves you half as much right now as God loves you. But God didn't just love God so loved. You going to preach on so, preacher? Yes, I am. The word so is the little Greek word hutos. And it means in this manner, in this way, to this degree... To this extent, it's talking about the way in which God loved. See? How did he love? 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and that is exactly what we are. 1 John 3, verse 16. By this thing, we even understand love because he laid down his life for us. 
We don't even understand what agape love is except by looking at what God did on the cross. God gave himself in a way he laid down his life. There's no way we can comprehend that kind of love. God so loved. 1 John 3.18, God didn't love by a long distance call and said, I love you. God did something. Folks, love is demonstrated by what we do. God didn't just say it. God did it. God did think something that was great. That's the kind of love. That's how God so loved. Verse John 4, verse 10. Herein is love. It's not that we loved God. We didn't, we didn't make the move toward Him. It's that He loved us and gave Himself to be a propitiation for our sins. God's love was given when we didn't deserve it. It's amazing love, as the song says. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me? It's boundless love, as another song says. It is wonderful love, the wonderful love of Jesus. Or as the song says, the love of God is like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. It is the love of God that will never fail or lose its glory until we see him face to face. Paul wrote, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's there's no way that words can convey how much or how deep or how wide is the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That's the love that we're told about when it says God so loved. But who did God love? And what did God love? God so loved the world. Oh, that's a mind blower there. God didn't love perfect people. God didn't love just people that can do more than anybody else can do. God didn't love people that don't make any mistakes. God loved the world. What do you mean by that, John? Listen to John 1 verse 10. He came into the world, and the world was made by him. Listen. But the world did not know him. You mean the world is people that don't know God? Yes. 1 John 5, verse 19. The whole world lieth in the evil one. There are people that are in Christ, right? And we're thankful for the sacrifice and the fact that we can be in Christ. But there are other people that are in the evil one. And the world describes people that are in the evil one. Is that who God loved? I think it is. In John 12, verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. You mean the world is those people over whom Satan is the prince? That can't possibly be who God loved, is it? I think it is. John 15, 19, Jesus is talking to his disciples. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But since you are not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You mean the world are those that hate Jesus and hate his fault? That's who God loved? I think that's what he's saying. John 3, 17, right after this verse, says, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. God loved the world. You don't have to earn God's love. God loved you before you did anything good. God loved the world. Isn't that amazing? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for all ours only, but also for the sins of the world. God so loved the world. Miss Vivian, that's the object of the verb right there. God so loved the world. What did God love? Whom did God love? Well, what did that God make do? Make, what did that make God do? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. See... God's love moved God to give. When we really love, we act. It matters what we do. God showed us in action. You uh, husbands that stand by your wives and you wives that stand by your husbands year after year after year, 
You show your love by your actions, by your forgiveness, by your kindness, by your service to the very end. That's the way God loved. He acted. Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, will he not also, along with him, freely give us everything? 1 John 3, verse 18. He loved not in word nor with the tongue, but in deed and with the truth. Being equal with God, it says, he did not think that equality with God was something to be held on to, but emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, yea, the death of of the cross. That's how God loved. That's how God gave. The song the kids sing. He came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. I will never understand the intimacy of the relationship between the Father and the Son. John 1.18 calls Jesus the only God who was in the bosom of the Father. What does that mean? Well, in the bosom of means they sat right next to each other at the table. They were as close as two people can be. Remember, John was at the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. Remember that? And you remember when Lazarus couldn't even get a crumb from the rich man's table? That it says that when he died, he went in Abraham's bosom. He's going to be at the great banquet table right next to Abraham. And you remember that? So in the bosom of the Father means they were right there together. There was an intimacy. There was a love. They were one together. This love was great. How could God? How could God allow that one with whom he is most intimate to become flesh and to suffer as he suffered and to die for our sins, and to become sin on our behalf, 2 Corinthians 5, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. I don't know. But I do know that this Bible says that He gave His only Son. Why did He give His only Son? That whosoever, that whosoever. One more time, that whosoever. There you go. All right? Whoever is a big, fat word. It's a huge word. Every person we ever see, every person you've ever known, every person that you haven't ever met, every person in every country of every race, of every tribe, of every economic standing, of every gender, every person is in that word, whoever. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3, this is good and acceptable with God who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9, God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance, whosoever. Acts chapter 10, verse 35, in every nation, he that fears him and does right is acceptable to him. In the gospel of John itself, that whoever included Andrew and then Simon, his brother. It included Philip, who was from Bethsaida, and then Nathaniel, who said, can anything good ever come out of Nazareth? It included that Samaritan woman that we talked about last time that was so different from the people of God. It included that lame man had been laying around that stinking pool for 38 years. It included the blind man that had never seen a thing and had mud put on his eyes. It included Zacchaeus, didn't it? The tax collector that everybody hated. It included the sinful woman who came in weeping and crying at Jesus' feet and had such poor self-esteem. It included the Philippian jailer who didn't know God until Paul told him about it. It included the eunuch who was from we're way down there in Africa, but wanted to know about God that he'd never known. It included Cornelius, who was a Roman soldier who was seeking God, and the Jews hated Roman soldiers. It included Saul, like John told us this morning, the killer of Christians. It included Lydia, the seller of purple. And it includes you. Why? Oh, you. You are right there in that word, whosoever. Jesus Christ died for you. God loves you. He came so that whosoever, but whosoever what? So that whosoever believes in him. What does that mean? 
Say there, everybody in here, you, maybe there's probably some that don't, but the majority of people in here believe in Jesus intellectually. What does this mean? John 1, 12. I'll let the Bible speak. As many as received him, to them he gave power to be children of God, even to those who believe on his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. So those that receive Jesus are the same as those who believe on Jesus are the same as those who are born of God. Unless I'm missing the point. John 3, 36. He who believes on the Son of God has eternal life. But he who disobeys the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. Believing includes obeying God because you trust him enough to follow him and try to do his will. Uh, What is believing? John 8, verse 24. Certainly it includes conviction. If you're not convicted, you can't believe. Jesus was talking to people who were rejecting him in John 8, 24. And he says, I told you that you would die in your sins. And unless you believe that I'm he, you shall die in your sins. You remember Thomas. We've talked about him a hundred times. He said, if I can't put my finger in the holes, I will not believe. And then he did put his finger in the holes in Jesus' side and hand. And then Jesus said, because you've seen me, Thomas, you have believed. But blessed are those like you and me who have not seen me and yet believe. And we believe because of the testimony. John 20, verse 31. Why was the gospel of John written? These things are written that you may believe on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. What does that mean? As you keep on believing, as you keep on trusting... As you keep on depending on the work of God and the cross, you keep on trusting in His grace, you keep on trying to follow Him day after day. When you stumble, you get back up. As you keep on believing, that's what it means to believe. So, that whosoever believes in Him finally should not perish, but should have eternal life. Let's go back to snake bit. What was happening to those those grumbling, complaining, rebellious Israelites in the desert when they were bitten by those poisonous snakes. I bet their limbs were swelling up and they were turning blue and their tongues were getting thick and they could feel themselves doing what, church? Dying. They were dying. They were perishing. But God makes a way, doesn't he? He put that snake up there. God does not want them to perish. Listen to me. He doesn't want you to perish. In fact, he sent his son so that you would not perish. See? Why did he love? Why did he give? So that whoever believes in him should not perish. That's not just pie in the sky. God's intention is that we don't perish. Listen to John 5, 24. He who hears my word and believes the one who sent me has eternal life and cometh not into judgment but is passed out of death into life. When we come to Jesus Christ, we pass out of death. We were dead spiritually. But we pass out of death into life. We come into God's grace. We come into the continually cleansing blood of Christ. We stand in the grace of the Lord. John 5, 25. The time is coming and now is when the dead, and that's everybody that doesn't have Jesus, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those that hear will live. Are you listening to the voice of the Son of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ? The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. God doesn't want us to perish. What does He want? He wants us to have eternal life. He wants us to have life in fellowship with God. What does that mean? John 17, 3. Listen to the Bible. This is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and He whom you sent, even Jesus Christ. God loves imperfect people. God loves struggling people. God loves people that mess up. God loves people that sin. God loves people who are trying. God loves people that will come to him and accept Jesus and trust in his son and keep trying to do his will. That's who God loves. He that has the son of God, 1 John 5 verse 12, has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. By this we know that we have eternal life because of the things that I've written to you, says John. So, go to the last slide. 
Here's the question. I want you to know from this verse today that God loves us. He loves you, and He wants nothing more than your salvation. And there's there's every every uh, uh, reason to believe that if you're in Christ, you're going to be saved. See, that's where our security and our hope and grace is. God is for us. But the plan of salvation is that you must be convicted about Jesus. You've got to hear and believe the gospel. You've got to turn to God and be willing to follow him wherever that takes you, whatever he commands you to do in repentance. You've got to confess him as your master. You must be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then just trust in his grace and keep following him no matter what. Isn't this wonderful message today, wonderful news? If you need to come, please do as we stand together and as we sing.